Here at Crosspoint, we love to be a place where faith and life intersect, where the reality of what God has done for us becomes a reality as we live that out in our lives. We love to be a place where we can connect in relationships, grow in our faith, serve with our gifts, and share the love that God has given to us. We started a series called Explore God, and last week we asked the question, does life have purpose? And in, in working through that question, realize, yes, life does have purpose because God himself gives that purpose. To which we ended the message and said, well, if, if God is the one who gives life purpose, then I suppose we have to ask the question, is God real? And again, as we go through this uh, series, certainly as these questions are real for you, I pray that God's spirit brings answers and settles the answers in your heart. If these questions are already settled in your heart, I pray that God gives us wisdom and ability to better articulate and to have conversations with others who have these very real and important questions that are being asked. So I pray that God's Spirit gives you exactly what you need today as we contemplate the reality of God and looking at evidence for God in different aspects of our life. In asking the question, is there a God? Um, it's certainly a, a, a question that people are asking. And perhaps closely connected to the question, is there a God, is, is there one true God? And perhaps that question is a little bit more pertinent in our culture. Both are important. Is there a God and which is the true God? But it's interesting as, as we just saying that as God reveals himself, and we'll, we'll touch on that in our message today, the, the God that the Bible introduces everything with in Genesis chapter 1, the God who parted the seas, the God who was with David, the shepherd, is the same God that was with the Apostle Paul, the same God that maybe before that, Jesus Christ himself, who walked and talked and went to the cross on our behalf, the same God that was with the Apostle Paul, the same God that is with us today. And when I'm, when I'm asked the question, you know, how do we know who the true God is? Or to put it another way, like we all believe in the same God, call him by different names. The, the reality is there's, I, I know there is one God who will not put himself in that category. And I'm not gonna, in essence, put words in God's mouth, but he said, well, if all the other gods wanna agree that they're the same and just use different names, fine. But I am not gonna agree to that because there is only one true God. And in Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul is with a group of, of Greek philosophers in the city of Athens. And I don't know if, if any of you have had the chance to travel to Athens, but in the old part of the city, um, a, my brother and a cousin and I, uh, years ago, had the opportunity to be in Athens. And we kind of pictured what the Apostle Paul was writing, because you see a temple to this, and you see a, a, an altar to this God, and you have all these different entities that are recognized and structures that are built. And as part of that ancient uh, culture, there were worship practices. And into this, the Apostle Paul says, I noticed something missing. And what even you acknowledge as potentially missing, let me fill that in with the reality of not just another God to add to your mix, but the one true God. The Apostle Paul interacting with the people in Athens in Acts chapter 17, beginning at verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A, a group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to dispute with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears and we want to know what they, what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. 
For as I walked around and caref looked carefully at your objects of worship, I f even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Now what you worship as something unknown, I am going to procla proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything because he himself gives all men life and breath and everything else. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth and he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by man's design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left, for, left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysius, a member of the Areopagus, and also a woman named Damaris, and a number of others. God's word for our hearts this morning. We'll be looking at a number of, of different passages, uh, beginning with the very first passage of the Bible, as we consider the question, is there a God? Is there a God? My guess is if I asked for a show of hands or went around the room and just had you answer the question with a simple yes or no, my guess is a vast majority that are here would say, yes, there is a God. You say, okay, we got that one answered. We'll see you next week. Like I said, in this series, I'd, I'd, I'd like it to be beneficial in, in two ways. One is that as this question comes up in our own hearts and minds, that we have more to consider, more to contemplate, and that ultimately God's Spirit leads us to His truth and to understanding the answer to the question. And also to be better equipped as we grow in our confidence of being able to answer the question, to have more tools or resources as this question comes up in discussion to say, how might, how might I answer this question? So if someone were to ask you, I don't think there's a God. Do you think there's really a God? Maybe beginning with the end in mind, one of the things at the end of each of the messages, there's a few questions. I like to answer questions with questions sometimes, and maybe that can be frustrating. But if someone were to ask, what do you think? Is there a God? Before I would answer the question, I would simply say, well, you're, you're asking that for an important reason. Help me understand just what's leading up to this question. Give me a little background. And then the story unfolds to a certain degree. And you have a better reason. And next week, we're going to talk about why is there evil and suffering in the world. And oftentimes, that, that is a catalyst to be asking the question, I, I, I can't believe there's a God if this is what life is like. And we'll tackle that question next week. But is there a God? How, how can I know that there is a God? Because I would guess also if I would ask you this morning, and say, how, how many of you have seen God face to face? How many of you have had a personal, like I seen, touched, experienced, and I can vouch by personal experience that I have seen the almighty, holy God? We may have felt his presence. We may have recognized something he did, 
but I would say we'd have a hard time saying, I have encountered God. So when we ask this question, today we're going to look at the, the internal and external evidence for God. I remember watching a debate. There was an atheist and a Christian. And here's a piece of advice. If you're ever challenged to a debate about the existence of God, don't give up your main tool. For some reason, the Christian agreed to a foundation that said, I will not use the Bible to argue for the existence of God. To me, that's like someone challenging you to a duel and say, you put your gun away, I'm going to have mine. But that being said, I think it is important for us as Christians, not only to have an answer that says, this is what the Bible says, but also to have a rational argument that makes sense. But I wouldn't give up one or the other, but rather combine the both. And that's what I'd like to do today, is by looking at the scripture, also allowing our minds to say, there are reasonable reasons to say that God is real. So I will answer the question and say, God is real. There's no doubt in my mind. And as we look at the pages of scripture, the Bible itself operates on the presence, premise that God is real. Genesis chapter one, verses one and two. This is how the Bible starts. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then it goes on chapter one, and God said, and God said, and God this, and God that. And with the exception of the book of Esther, every other book in the Bible mentions, alludes to the existence of God. And the book of Esther fits into God's salvation history as Esther is used by God to preserve the Jewish people. So the Bible assumes and the Bible states and the Bible communicates the reality that God exists. But if I did not have the Bible, but yet, put it this way, if I understand what the Bible says as truth, I ought to be able to realize that truth play out in life. Here's what I mean. If God is real, as the Bible describes, and he created the world, I ought to be able to see the existence of God or evidence for the existence of God and creation around me, right? If the Bible claims that God is the creator of all things, even if I don't read Genesis chapter one, I ought to be able to see evidence of the divine in nature around me. And that's our first main point. If God is real, we expect to find evidence in nature. Because as the Bible describes, and we wholeheartedly believe that God created this world in six 24-hour days, on the seventh day he rested. So if that is true, I ought to be able to see evidence of God's existence in nature. So where do we see that? The first thing we realize about nature around us is the order of creation speaks to a divine designer. As you look around the building this morning, if you look at one of the stained glass windows and you go, you know what, that's amazing. I had a bunch of different colored glass bottles. I threw them into the bottom of my trash can and out, out popped this. Why are you laughing? Because we naturally understand when there's an order to something, it has a designer, it has a creator to it. The Psalms say this. So again, this is mixing internal and external evidence for the existence of God. In Psalm 139, the psalmist says, for you, God, created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. As you look at this next picture of just some of the, uh, a snapshot of some of the parts of our human body, and you realize how intricately and wonderfully it's made, and we've spent years studying it, and we're continuing to study it, and there's still things about it we don't fully understand. 
we realize that there is a design to this system. And not just to one system, but to all the systems. And a design to how the systems interact. And God has put that together because he is the divine designer. And when I see order, and I see structure, and I see design, it leads me to conclusions that someone had to design that. This didn't, didn't happen by random chance. And I get there's a lot of arguments on the evolutionary side of how these proteins and that could have evolved together, etc. But you know that when you design something, if you've ever even done a piece of art or a, piece of, a project of some kind, there are steps that you take to bring to completion that project. When you look at the systems of the body, let alone the cell itself, there are multiple systems within even one of your microscopic cells for all of those to come together at exactly the same time and survive while other systems were coming together for them to survive. The, the statistical and mathematical chance are impossible. Just like you chuckled and said, you know, there's no way the window if I just threw a bunch of di different colored bottles into the bottom of my trash bin and the Texas heat was so hot that it melted them all together that I wouldn't come out with something that we can recognize has design and order. So when I see order in creation, it leads me to understand that there is a divine designer. Now I get in these arguments, it's not gonna necessarily lead me to who that true God is, but it leads me to aspects about who the true God is that as we put it together and then God himself reveals himself in the scripture, gives us that full picture. When I see order and creation, it leads me to a divine designer. When I see complexity of creation, it speaks to divine wisdom. We've probably asked individuals when we've encountered something we don't quite understand, you go, how did you figure that out? Right, because they had a piece of wisdom, a piece of knowledge that you didn't have. You're like, wow, that's amazing. I could have never figured that out. I love this scripture from Job. Job probably lived around the time of Abraham. We know him for how wealthy he was and how blessed he was. And then his faith was challenged and all that was taken away, including all the way down to his health. And he reigned faithful to the Lord in the midst of suffering. We learn a lot about suffering, etc. And the Lord restored to him those blessings. But in the midst of this discussion, he says, but ask the animals and they will teach you or the birds in the sky, and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth, and it will teach you. Or let the fish in the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. I would love to interview our cats <laughs> and have them speak and say, what do you know about how you got here? I would love to ask the waves of the Gulf of Mexico and say, how did you come to be in the seashore that stops the waves? Why are you here? What Job is saying is if, we, if creation could speak, it would speak to a creator. And as we see the complexity of the world around us, the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, etc., Again, it says, how did you figure that out? This next picture is just a microscope of the double helix, the genetic system in each of our cells. Man, how could you, like we, we've been spending years imprinting information on microchips in the amount of information that drives your life that's imprinted in this genetic structure is one we're still studying and seeking to understand. And when you see something complex like that, filled with information, there's wisdom behind that. And when I see complexity in nature, I see divine wisdom. When I see power, 
When I see force of creation, it speaks to divine power. In Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. There's a couple thoughts in here. One is, when we look at creation, we see God's divine power. Now remember, maybe some of the accounts where Jesus and his disciples are on the Sea of Galilee, a big storm comes up, and they're worried about drowning and not making it back to shore. And all of a sudden, Jesus, because he is God, says, be still, and the late waves quiet, and the wind calms down. And they're like, truly, this is the Son of God. Why would they come to that conclusion? Because someone who has more power than the power of the waves and the wind leads them to conclude this must be God. Now I get in our culture and our time, we're trying to control the wind and the waves and we're trying to promote that we can control everything about the world and our globe, etc. There's only one who has power over creation. And that's the one who created it. And so when I see the lightning and I see the wind, and I see the force of nature, it leads me to a conclusion that there's one who has divine power because no human being can replicate this. The Apostle Paul said, this is evident in creation so that people are without excuse the order, the complexity, the force of nature speak to God's design, God's wisdom, and God's power. And so, again, as the Bible says, God created the heavens and the earth. As that is true, I ought to be able to see evidence of a divine creator, of God himself in creation, which we do. This is going to sound blunt, but the psalmist said this, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. I'm not going to make light of the question. If this is a question that you or someone you know is struggling with, let's have a conversation about it. But the psalmist concludes as the Apostle Paul says, God has put this in nature so that people are without excuse. There has to be in a deliberate aversion to acknowledging the existence of God because nature is screaming it around me. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Because it's denying the evidence. It's denying what is in front of us. If God is real, I would expect to find him in nature, which we do. If God is real, we expect to find a natural awareness of him. What do I mean by that? If God is real and God is the creator of everything, including you and me, we would expect to find some awareness that God is real. Now, it's interesting what I read in Acts chapter 17. What did the Greeks do? They got a God for this, a God for that, right? That human culture has developed the concept of God, put structures around things that are called God for centuries. Perhaps we don't have to look any farther than that awareness to say, why would this concept of God be popping up in cultures around if God were not a real thing? And again, it doesn't speak to which God is the true God, but just the concept of God. Why would I keep forming things why would I keep building buildings if this were not real? You might understand, okay, there's just isolated culture that did this thing called God thing, but I see it nowhere else in the world. But we see it everywhere else in the world. Could it be that inside God has built a natural awareness of him? Just like nature proclaims his existence, so our internal awareness proclaims his existence. First, in this way, the reality of God is expressed by the natural spirituality of man. 
The reality that inside each of us is a desire to connect with God. We may not always identify it as such, we may not always pursue it as such, but inside there is something more than just the physical. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. God has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the heart, human heart, yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. He has set eternity. Why do we naturally fear death? You ever wonder that? Because we don't want to die. <laughs> Why is that? Because there's a part in us that wants to live to get forever, and there's a part in us that God has put that will live forever. We could take time looking at Genesis chapter 3. God created mankind to live in a relationship with him forever. Sin is what ruined that. Sin is what gets in the way. But inside each person is a spiritual component called the soul. You go, why, why is that? If God is not real, why would there be a spiritual component? But again, if God is real, we'd expect to find an awareness of him. And again, it may not always tell us who that real, true God is, but it's an evidence that God is real. Secondly, the reality of God is expressed by a natural opposition to God. I find this one a bit intriguing. Not to be over simple or silly, but if you know the boogeyman is not real, you're not going to try and oppose him. Now, you may believe for a while when you were growing up that there was a boogeyman in your closet and you realize, no, he's not real. It's interesting to me. Sometimes the vehement, let alone violent reaction against God in that concept. You say, well, why is that? In Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul writes, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the Spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. Why is there this natural opposition to God? And how do I understand that? I understand it by looking first and foremost in my own heart. Because my sinful nature, I have a sinful nature that resists the reality of God, and I don't want God to have a say in my life. I want to do what I want to do. And I don't want anybody else or anything else outside of myself directing what is right or what is wrong. If God were not real, I would not have that aversion. It's real for you too. Each of you have a sinful nature that hates God, that stands opposed to God, that does not want to do what God wants you to do, does not want to hear what God wants you to hear. And as that sinful nature stands opposed to God in a subtle way, it's proving the existence of God. I just don't always know what to do with it. And so sometimes the answer is, I'm going to pretend that God doesn't exist. I'm going to pretend that I'm not accountable to anyone, or I'm going to set up my system of how I appease what I know as a discord with whatever this is called God. The reality of God is expressed by a natural opposition to God. And third, the reality of God is expressed by a natural accountability to God. Again, the Apostle Paul is the, in the book of Romans touches on a number of these, these realities of why is the human condition, why is the human soul have this thing that we call a conscience. 
And the Apostle Paul observed this and he wrote of it in chapter two. He says, let me, uh, the use of the word law here is used in a couple different ways. So I'll explain that as I read through this. Indeed, when the Gentiles, who were non-Jews, right? So the Gentiles were not given the Mosaic law like the Jewish culture and the Jewish people were. So indeed, when the Gentiles who do not have the law, do not have the written Mosaic Ten Commandments type law, do by nature things required by the law. So think of some of the Ten Commandments, you should not kill, you should not steal, that even if I don't have those written down, generally, if someone would say, I'm going to take your life, you're like, no, that's not okay, you can't do that. Well, why not? I think it's okay. It's not okay. Our conscience tells us that's not okay. Even if we don't have the Bible or acknowledge it, there's an inner sense of what's right and wrong. Paul continues, they, the Gentiles, are a law for themselves, right? Our conscience gives us some guidance of what's right and wrong for us. And we hear that in our culture. Well, I'll determine what's right and wrong for me. What I'm doing is I'm forming my conscience and my awareness, even though they do not have the law, the written law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences now also bearing witness and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. How do we know that this is a reality in people's life? Because they're constantly trying to appease their conscience either by believing something that they think was wrong or they were told was wrong is no longer wrong. They set up systems of performance by which they can say, well, I know I did that wrong, but I'm gonna do this better and I'm gonna live life better and I'm gonna do more right than they're wrong. We look at even back, back in, in Paul's day, all the, all the different gods in the temples, etc., were some way to say, okay, we, and a lot of times they were combined, the nature gods and the conscious God and say, well, we angered the sun God, so let's make a temple to the sun God. And if we're not getting enough sun, we'll have this ritual that we'll do that will get the attention of the sun God. And then hopefully the sun God will give us what we want from them or the rain God or whatever it may be. The reality is, is human nature wants to be right with God. And when you look at world religions, when you look at world religions, you see systems by which the performance of people are trying to make right their relationship with whatever they call God. For the Muslims, it's the pillars. The Vedas for the Hindu. The meditation for the Buddhist. Why is that? Because inside each soul is a recognition that I'm accountable to God. And it bothers me when I feel like that is not right. The great message of the Bible is it reveals to us not only these truths, that God is creator and that God is holy and perfect. It solves both questions by directing us to say, who is the true God? If I can see God in creation, who is the one who put this together? Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Bible goes on to explain. As I feel accountable to this higher being, etc., why is my conscience guilty and what do I do with that? God reveals himself and says, I loved you so that I sent my son Jesus for you. You see, what happens by these two awarenesses of nature and our conscience. As we read in Acts 17, God put those in our hearts so that we might seek him. You see, this is such a vital and important question because we don't wanna just answer and say, yeah, there's a God and accept that there are many different gods. It's a question that is to lead us on a search for the true God by which God in his grace said, let me reveal myself to the pages of the scripture that I am not only creator and not only perfect, but I am also your savior. And see, that's the comfort and the peace that as God's spirit leads us on this journey to answer the question, is there a God? To lead us to see and to understand and to believe who that true God is and how much he loves you and what he's done for you. And as I recognize the grace and mercy of God, perhaps there's another category that says, what gives evidence that there is a God? Because if God is real and he's the creator, if God is real and I have this 
awareness of him, then I also see how deeply God cares for his creation, specifically you and me, humanity. Because if God is this real being, he may be perceived as this distance out there, I'm never going to be in touch with him. But I would say if God is real, he's going to show up in attributes of his creation, not just in my conscience, but how I interact with others. And obviously for for us as God's people who know Jesus as our savior and what the grace of God means as he comes to us, these attributes flow from, because we've experienced them from God. The first is goodness. If God is real, we can expect him to care deeply for for his people. God is realized in goodness. Third John, verse 11. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil has not seen God. This kind of se- begins to segue into next week's topic of why is there good, why is there evil, etc. But here the Apostle John says, here, here's the black and white reality. Goodness comes from God, evil does not. Evil is the absence of goodness. Evil is the absence of God in the heart of the individual, a culture, a society. Evil is not a creation of God. It's what happens when God is not around, when God is not honored, when God is not in my heart. Evil is what prevails. The sinful nature that opposes God is what prevails. And so when we see goodness show up, it's recognized by people who go, wow, that was really different. There is still goodness in the world. Like, why would I expect to see some awareness of goodness? Because God is the ultimate good. And God has shown me, through Jesus, the ultimate good. God is realized in goodness. God is realized, secondly, in love. Again, hate is the absence of love. It's what happens when love is no longer around. Again, the Apostle John in his first letter, chapter 4, verse 16, and so we know and rely on the love of God, the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. There's a lot we could unpack in this short verse. The essence of God is love. And in his love, he is also just and he carries out both perfectly. Perfectly. God is love. He sent Jesus for you and for me, for the world. We know and rely on the love God has for us. If God is real and God is love, we ought to be able to experience that love which he has given to us in Christ. And as that love lives in our hearts, that love is reflected as we live with others. Whoever lives, in the love, whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. So when I see sacrificial, selfless love show up, like God must be real because God is the source of love. God is love. And third, God is realized in truth. One of many passages, Isaiah 45, verse 19, I, the Lord, speak the truth. I declare what is right. Lies are the absence of truth. Evil is the absence of good. Hatred is the absence of love. The essence of God is goodness, love, and truth. When I see any of those show up, they are subtle statements of God's reality. I know today perhaps you feel like you're in the market square in Athens debating with the Epicureans and the Stoics and today sounds like a bunch of philosophy. But I 
I pray it gives you something to think about in regard to this question, is God real? That combines both a rational argument that says, when I see things that are complex, when I see things that have design, when I see things that have power beyond any human ability to create that power, I have to conclude there is something bigger. There is something divine. When I reflect inside and I have a sense of guilt or have a sense of accountability to something or someone that I have to appease my conscience, it's there to remind me that there is a holy, righteous God. And when I see goodness and love and truth, it's evidence that God is at work around us. But most importantly, when we ask the question, is there a God? We want to know who that one God is that distinguishes and separates himself from any other God. And it truly is the one who created the universe. It is a holy, righteous, perfect God. But what separates the God who has revealed himself, not only in nature, not only through our conscience, not only through the, the, the morality that when it shows up in the world around us, but most importantly, through the cross and his son, Jesus, That is the God that this question sends us on a search for, and by God's grace, he answers the question. and says, the one true God is the God who truly created you, knit you together in your mother's womb, gave you purpose. The one true God is the one who, yes, is perfect, and the one who you sense your accountability to, and we realize that our ability to set that straight is not going to ever be accomplished. It's the God who sent his son to give you perfection. So you don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear standing before a holy, righteous God. You don't have to spend a lifetime making, making right with God, but just living in gratitude for what God has done for you. And that we truly know goodness we truly have experienced love and we have a source of all truth, the words of God himself, so that we can be a light in this world and be a witness for him. So we can look at nature. We can see in our conscience and we see in truth, God is real. The God of the Bible is real. The God who loves you is real. The God who sent his son for you is real. The God who has done everything for you to spend an eternity with him is real. Let's pray. Father, thank you for revealing yourself in so many ways. While some may be incomplete, we thank you for your complete revelation of who you are and what you've done for us in the pages of Scripture. Let the reality of who you are and what you've done for us sink deeply into our hearts and let that conviction grow day after day. And then, Father, we, we ask that your Spirit would place us in settings where hearts are truly asking this question, is there a God? And with wisdom only you can give and compassion of heart that you only can instill, let us confidently engage in that conversation and use us for those who are exploring who you are to be ready to give a reason for the hope we have that you are the God who created us and gave us purpose. You are the God who saved us and have given us an eternity. And you are a God who loves us and gives an, us an opportunity to live and express that love for a lifetime. Father in heaven, we thank you for establishing a relationship with us 
through Jesus and his cross and through the power of your spirit. We thank you for calling us your children. And with that confidence, we pray to you, Lord, you know each of the hearts and the situations here. And as individuals lift up their prayers to you, because of Jesus, we ask you to hear them and answer them. Because we know you are good, we know whatever answer you give is for our best. We know because you are loving, you will always operate with our best interest and heart. And because we know you are truth, we know you will guide us into truth. Father in heaven, for all the needs of body and soul, you've invited us to pray and you've taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Have a blessed day and a blessed week ahead.